Hey church family, it's JB and I'm with you for August the 16th, our Bible Studies for Life Sunday School lesson. We have been journeying through Ephesians and today our passage is in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 17 through 32. Uh, this is about how we uh, need to encourage each other and we also need to be encouraged and so that's the point today. As we uh, get started, um, one of the, the writers put this in here, and it says the Christian life can be hard. Christian life can be hard, and temptations abound, and we sometimes struggle to honor God with every uh, word we say, right? Every thought we have. Encouragement from fellow believers is a great help. Their words of support push us forward when we might be tempted to give in. We need the encouragement of other believers, and they need ours. Amen? Um, they also have a uh, uh, just a vignette of this um, world-renowned uh, photographer. Uh, back in the 1800s, he bought a camera and took 50 pictures, and 49 of those pictures were garbage. They were no good, and his dad said, Ugh, you know, uh, you need to find another hobby. But his mom really encouraged him with the that one picture that actually came out right. And he goes on, this young man goes on to be a world-renowned um, photographer. And so I know in your life you've had those uh, that come to mind that were big encouragers and all of those things. And so uh, I know that Paul was a big encouragement too. And as he writes to the uh, church at Ephesus, you know, he was there for three years uh, on uh, his missionary journeys. He was there uh, pretty much the longest, and so he was near and dear to the uh, church at Ephesus, and so he wanted to encourage them. But you know Saul's uh, story uh, as he was a murderer uh, um, following and persecuting those of the way, the Christ followers then, um, he was miraculously changed uh, by uh, Jesus uh, through salvation and uh, Barnabas, uh, then takes on Paul, uh, the new man, Paul, and uh, encourages him, right? Because uh, Christ followers were like, no, we're not going to let him in our club and, and all of these things because we know what he's about. And Barnabas was, hey, you know, Paul is uh, the new man and he's been saved. He's been transformed by Christ and we need to uh, allow him to speak. We need to allow him to, uh, to, to come in our gathering. And so, the church, uh, Christ follower, uh, you need my encouragement, and I desperately need yours. And so that's the point of today. Let me pray uh, before we dive in. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you, Father, for uh, another morning, Lord, to, um, to get up and to praise you. Uh, Father, I'm so grateful, Father, uh, for the, the love that you put within us it's through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, and that we have access to you. But also we are uh, sealed. We're, we have a guarantee with the Holy Spirit living inside of us, giving us counsel, giving us guidance, Father. And so allow our minds to be transformed uh, as we are on this sanctification journey. Uh, Lord, thank you for doing the work for us. But allow us to choose uh, transformation and allow us to choose to order our uh, guard our mouths and to be encouragers, Father, so that we can... Um, uh, Lord, look, smell uh, uh, like a Christ follower to a unbelieving world. Uh, Lord, thank you for this time. Allow us to grow towards you, we pray. Amen. So, um, excuse me, <coughs> in uh, Ephesians 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 17, uh, this is where we're going to start. And so let me uh, turn over there. So Ephesians 4, 17 through 22. And Paul is writing here, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Verse 19. They have become callous and they've been, they have given up themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, verse 21, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, 
which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So Paul uh, uh, continues his uh, preaching here, continues his letter to the church at Ephesus, and he reminds them, hey, look, uh, you are no longer uh, in darkness. You are no longer callous because you are Christ's followers. Christ has set you free. And so that's what he um, uh, reminds them of, that Christ uh, has given them a radical transformation, putting off the old self, taking on the new self, the godly dispositions and fruitful behaviors. God saves us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. Through our new identity, he produces a new way of living. And so let's break down some of these um, verses uh, from the commentary that, uh, that's been provided to us. So uh, verse 17, Paul refers to uh, the Gentile community as pagan, right? Uh, the Gentiles are not the chosen ones. They're not the, the Jews. But at the same time, now Paul is being sent to them to remind them that, hey, because of Christ, Jews and Gentiles uh, uh, can be saved, right? And so, but he, he refers to the Gentile community as the pagan immoral community that they, uh, that they uh, synony synonymously um, kind of were, um, um, were used there as the Gentile word. Uh, more than just being um, ethnically Gentile. Uh, he goes on to say in verse 17 that it brings the futility of their thoughts, uh, that, that they have rejected the revelation of God in nature and also in the actions that they have, have, uh, ha have done. Uh, so verses 18 and 19, Paul continues to describe the uh, spiritual condition of Gentiles before they became Christ's followers. They were experiencing spiritual darkness uh, because they did not receive the spiritual light available to them, and that excluded them from uh, the life of God, it ex excluded them from godly living. Um, he also points out their hardness of hearts, um, and, and the hardness of hearts is not referring to the muscle that pumps blood, okay? It's referring to the inner person, uh, uh, the inner person, a uh, person's identity, okay? Um, uh, the hardness of heart is a word picture for a steady resistance to the revelation of God and uh, the things of God. Um, so that's what he's kind of talking about there. It's, it's um, uh, hardness of heart, uh, uh, your callous heart, it uh, uh, doesn't begin, but it kind of ends, or it does begin with immoral lifestyles, right? With immoral choices. Um, if you uh, begin to... Um, to, to uh, look away from God and not, not uh, choose to, um, to open your, your heart to Him, to, to uh, repent and, 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 and turn your faith towards Him um, or have faith in Him, then uh, you know, hardness of heart uh, will occur. Uh, the callousness will, will occur. Uh, so um, Paul talks about all of those things. Verses 20 and 21 uh, he transitions to Christ. He transitions to um, uh, talk about those, those people who he's preaching to, uh, who he's talking to, uh, how they have come to Christ. That's not you, the callous, darkened people uh, that are uh, far from God, sinful people. You are uh, Christ's followers. You are the new man. Um, and so he uh, talks about that in verses 20 and 21. He says uh, there that you have been taught by Christ. And, and by this time, uh, there weren't many eyewitnesses uh, uh, maybe left um, in Ephesus, if any, uh, that saw Jesus' burial and his resurrection. And so he's saying, hey, you know, um, you have been taught by him, or at least been taught by his ways, right, from the other apostles or the pastors and things like that. So that's kind of what he's, he's talking about there. Before uh, they were saved as pagans, they were spiritually ignorant. But now as Christ followers, they had become enlightened about God's sin and their salvation. Verse 22 ends there with Paul depicting a radical change, right? The radical change that he experienced becoming a Christ 
follower. The word picture involves taking off old or soiled clothes and putting on new or fresh clothes. And uh, the Greek there for new, there's two Greek words for new. Um, this is not talking about, um, you know, uh, um, uh, freshening up your uh, old sneakers or whatever and, and uh, cleaning them or whatever. This new that he's talking about is that sneaker, the old sneaker that's old and dirty, and that old sinner, okay, has been transformed. There's a new, there's a new creation uh, in that. And so that's really neat, uh, a neat, uh, neat um, uh, thinking there. And, and as he was teaching, he says to take off your former way of life uh, because it's enslaved to sin uh, and it is, it has uh, de deceitful desires. And he goes on to to, um, to say that at the end in verse 22. Um, so to summarize 17 through 22, Christ followers aren't to do the same things as sinners, right? As uh, non-Christians, okay? So Christ followers are not to do the same things as non-Christians. Christ followers are not to be ignorant of God's commands, right? Christ followers aren't uh, uh, to allow their hearts to become hardened um, to the things of God. Christ followers aren't to increasingly pursue impure living as non-Christians do. And living in sin is not how Jesus taught us to live. Okay, so that's the, uh, the summarization there. There's a question there that, I, um, that the uh, curriculum asks. It says, what makes taking off the old self so difficult? What, what makes taking off the old self so difficult? And I wrote down that our fallen nature is the default nature, right? Um, I get mad, I uh, default to the old uh, nature, the old JB, right? Selfishness, pride, all of those things, right? So I default very quickly to that. In my transformation, in my sanctification, okay, um, I'm gonna be more mature. I'm, I, I need to be encouraged in those things. I need to get in God's word and, and uh, renew my mind. Uh, but um, it's easy for us to default back to our old nature. It's hard to rely on the Spirit. Who The Holy Spirit, another, another reason why uh, it's, it's hard to take off the old self, is um, it's hard to rely on the Holy Spirit who we cannot see, right? And it's easier to rely on worldly pleasures, worldly vices, whatever, that we can hold. Um, and so that's another reason uh, why uh, taking off the old self is so difficult. Transformation, I, I wrote down, is, is a process, right? It's a process. And, uh, and we need to spur each other on. We need to encourage each other uh, as we're in this process, okay? Um, so uh, we're, we are to put away sinful habits. And in uh, Ephesians 4, 23 through 28, we're also, we also learn to encourage others to live consistently in their new life in Christ. So Ephesians 4, 23 through 28. He goes on to say, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Verse 25, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Uh, and verse 28, let the thief or the sinner no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. And so he uh, transitions to, hey, uh, renew your minds. Um, here are some of the things that you need to do as Christ followers or, at, uh, um, you know, that you are doing now, but we need to spur each other on to do them even more so says, uh, take off our old sinful habits, put on the new self. Uh, the old self was excluded from the life of God in verse 18, while the new self was created according to God's likeness. I love uh, the fact that uh, he says that in God's likeness. Um, look at that in uh, verse, um, sorry, verse uh, 24. It says, um, to, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Where have you seen or heard 
um, that we were created in the likeness of God. So we were created in, his, in, in their image, in the likeness of God. You remember where? Genesis 1, right? Okay, good job, good job. I heard you, I heard you say that. So Genesis 1, uh, verse 26 and 27 talks about, hey, they created us, as in uh, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they created us, Adam and, Adam and Eve, in their likeness, right? Uh, and so that's what he's talking about there. In their likeness, Adam and Eve were perfect, right? Then they sinned. They were not perfect anymore. They were not in uh, God's likeness anymore. But because of Christ, this is what Paul says, because of Christ, you have taken off the old self, put on the new self because of your faith in Christ, and now you are made in the, in the uh, after created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. It's beautiful. I love that, that, that point that he just, he brings back again. Um, Paul has looked at Genesis. He has, uh, he has uh, looked at the, uh, the Pentateuch, right? Um, and as a, as a good Hebrew of Hebrews, right? He, he, um, he memorized that as a boy and all of those things. But either way, um, I love how uh, the Bible does not contradict itself. It's one story, right? And so that's a, that's a beautiful thing. Um, the next thing there is, uh, that was verse 24. Verse 25, uh, because we are members of one another, church family, right? We should be truthful. If we cannot trust the other believers to be honest, the fabric of the community of faith quickly unravels. He's, he's uh, giving some pastoral um, advice to the church at Ephesus there. If we can't trust each other, then what are the non-believers going to say if we're um, slandering each other or whatever, right? What are they going to say? And he continues on that in uh, verse 26 and 27. Paul warns uh, the readers about the dangers of inappropriate anger. No matter what prompts our anger, we should be careful. Paul said, do not sin in our anger. Men, we have an issue with this, don't we? The testosterone gets to going, we get angry, and it's very hard not to respond uh, in yelling or, or punching something or whatever, right? It's just something we have. But we are redeemed, Christ follower, right? Uh, and we need to transform our minds in thinking about that. We need to guard ourselves in that. Paul knew an angry outburst could give the devil an opportunity. And in another, and that is uh, verse uh, 26 and 27, uh, give no opportunity to the devil in verse 27. That opportunity is also in other versions of the foothold, right? Where the devil gets a foothold in your life because of that anger or because of that uh, lusting or, or whatever the sin is, right? Um, so, uh, so don't give the devil the opportunity there. Verse 28 uh, finishes, he says... Um, uh, uh, that, that Paul declares that the thief should do honest work with his own hands in order to be able to share with needy people. And he's talking to the Christ followers. He says, hey, look, this was you. You were the thief. You were the sinner, right? You are the sinner. And so you need to do good work um, so that you can share with others, so you can encourage others, encourage the church. Oh, was there anything else in that? If you if you have been a Christian, a Christ follower for any length of time, you know that growing in Christ likeness can be gift, uh, difficult, right? We need encouragement from others and they need our encouragement for the same reason. Let's help one another to live consistently with our new life in Christ. And so uh, the very last verses, verses um, 29 through 32 in Ephesians 4, we are, to, are uh, going to learn to take every opportunity to encourage others with our words, right? And I know uh, everyone that has clicked on, everyone that's listening right now, you don't have any issues with guarding uh, your tongue and uh, that you, every word that you say, you heard mama when she said, uh, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all, right? And uh, that wasn't mama's words, that was God's word, okay? So dive in with me, Ephesians 4, 29 through 32. Here's what it says. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. 
Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. So uh, let's break that down with the, with the commentary. Um, so <clears throat> I already told you, hey, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. It wasn't mama's words, that was God's word. That's what Paul is saying here. Look, uh, Christ follower, foul language should not be in our vocabulary. It should not be um, coming out of our uh, words, out of our minds, right? From the overflow of our hearts, the mouth speaks. We don't need to do that. What, what we need to do is build each other in, up in love. We need to encourage each other. Uh, and that's going to take some humility, right? It's going to take some um, uh, lowering yourself. Uh, uh, as I decrease, he must increase, is what John the Baptist said, right? Um, and so uh, that's what we need to do. We need to build others up. That, that glorifies God. Verse 30, Paul added that our behavior may grieve uh, might grieve God's Holy Spirit. The Spirit seals us for the day of redemption, is the words there in, in uh, verse uh, 30. Um, but our improper speech must be one thing that disappoints God, right? Our improper speech. So if you don't do it for mom, okay, don't do it for mama, speak nice words, do it for your Savior, right? Do it for your Savior. Uh, verse 31, Paul mentions several forms of inappropriate speech. He spells it out. He's, I, I just feel like he's, he's looking at the church at Ephesus as he's, as he's speaking this, as he's, as he's preaching, and they're like, oh man, you know, uh, well, what, what's he talking about here? So he spells it out, right? Paul warns against bitterness, anger, wrath. This kind of talk is a natural result of a lack of control of anger. When our emotions control us, our speech can be negative rather than positive. Let me say that again, because I need to hear that again. When our emotions control us, our speech can be negative rather than positive. We should also avoid shouting and slander, right? Um, Paul's last example of inappropriate speech is malice. Any speech that's motivated primarily by self-centeredness or some other bad motive is wrong for Christ followers. And so, uh, Christ follower, I need your encouragement uh, for sweet words, encouraging words to come out of my mouth, and, uh, and, and certainly I'm encouraging you in that way also. <clears throat> Verse 32, Paul turned to what he expected uh, from believers, okay? Uh, he said, be kind and compassionate, right? Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as Christ in, uh, as God in Christ forgave you. He concludes his discussion by reminding us that we should forgive others as God forgave us through Christ. And that is uh, so huge. I know when you're thinking about all of these things that you say, man, it's tough for me to uh, encourage so-and-so because they're always negative or whatever, um, but we need to do that. And what about this? We also need to forgive them, right? We also need to forgive them just as Christ forgave us. The recap or the summary of those verses, verses 29 through 32, unwholesome talk leads to a flurry of interpersonal sin. Life-giving words produce just the opposite, a wellspring of interpersonal joy. Speaking life-giving words both encourages our brothers and sisters in Christ and emulates our perfect Father in heaven. So let's depend on the Holy Spirit and build each other up with our words. We need the encouragement of others and they need ours also. So uh, Christ follower, what, what now? What should we do? I think the first thing there is talk to God, right? Maybe Paul stepped on some of your toes uh, in this. I know he stepped on my toes in thinking about the emotions there. I, I'm an emotionally uh, driven uh, guy and, uh, um, and, and a lot of times I just get, I get defensive when people uh, don't go uh, with my plan or whatever, and uh, and sometimes uh, you know hateful words, whatever. Just I, I default to this to the uh, to the old man, right? I default to my sinful nature, and I don't need to do that. So encourage me to do that, uh, to not do that, but to give life giving words and to take uh, criticism in a in a good way, right? It's good to be accountable with each other. It's good to take criticism. In that way, I have a long way to go. I'm on the journey, right? 
And so, uh, so I need to do that. I need to talk to God, and I need to ask his forgiveness in that, and then to help me, Holy Spirit, as, uh, as, I, uh, as he orders my steps and he guides my words, right? So that may be you. You may um, need to do that. Um, talk to yourself uh, is what the writer says here. Talk to yourself. What are some of those things that, that uh, Paul hits on that you need to reconsider, right? Um, he says, uh, consider memorizing Ephesians 4.29. No foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. That's a beautiful, beautiful verse there. And then the last thing is talk to others, right? Uh, think of three people who may be encouraged by your text or your cards or a phone call, okay? I know uh, that uh, many of you, like me, are uh, have the gift of gab and we can talk. And so that five-minute conversation that you thought was going to happen turns into 15 minutes, right? Uh, sometimes 30 minutes. Anyways, uh, we're, we're doing ministry here though, right? So uh, anyways, um, who, who's that person that, that the Holy Spirit's pricking your heart to give a call to? Um, uh, someone down the street or whatever, right? We need to encourage each other Christ followers and y'all encourage me too. So let me, um, let me read this. I think this is a, a great um, kind of uh, restating the, the, the big picture here. No one grows as a Christ follower in isolation and very little spiritual growth happens without the encouragement of other believers God has placed in our path. Be that person who encourages with both words and our actions. So let's, uh, let's go forth that way, Christ follower. Let's do that, Elkdale, and, uh, and be known um, by, by that. But be known by the light in us and the light in our words and actions. So let me pray for us. God, thanks so much, uh, Lord, for loving us, for forgiving us. Uh, we love because you first loved us, oh God. So thank you for that. I pray, Lord, for my Christ followers uh, that are um, that are with me today. If clicked on, Lord, there may be someone who doesn't know you, who has not uh, surrendered and repented of their sin, turned in by faith through your grace alone uh, to you, O oh God. And so I pray for the unbeliever right now. I pray for the the one that's still waffling, still thinking through this whole. A God thing, Jesus thing, Holy Spirit thing. And so I pray, Lord, that our actions as Christ followers will uh, not just convince them, but will um, uh, just op open the door uh, to them having more conversation about why we follow you, why we have the hope in you, oh God. Thank you for your word, that it's not my words that we are studying. Uh, Lord, it's your infallible word, the Holy Bible. And so thank you for that. I pray, oh God, that Elkdale would be a church to encourage each other and that we would be encouraged by others also. God, that I, I love uh, encouragement. I, that's my love language, oh God. And, and so I know that several other people, peoples too. And so uh, I pray that we would be a church of encouragement. Thank you for this time. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Have a great day.